Welcome. Thank you, uh, Z or Z? Z33, Z to be here together with Overtone. And um, yeah, I think we should start, otherwise, we are completely out of the schedule. Um, you know the schedule already, so I don't have to introduce every, everybody. Uh, but we, the idea was that we start with little introductions of Bernd Schulze, uh, beside me and me. And then we have a little kind of talk, because we did several years ago kind of talk like Eckermann and Goethe or whatever, or <laughs> Goethe and Eckermann, <laughs> about curating sound art. It's only published in German, so, so we have to talk now in English, what is also maybe funny. And, um, uh, but I think I give Bernd Schulz, who was the founder and for, I think, 15 years, the director, 85. right? From 85 to? More than. More than, to more than. 2002. Okay. 17 years? Yeah, 17 years. 17 years. The director, founder and director of the Stadtgalerie Saarbrücken. And um, when somebody was never there, maybe in Saarbrücken, because it's a tiny, little, nice town, but uh, which is what everybody knows in this world where people working with sound are the books and the catalogs. Uh, which Bernd produced with the artist because he made a lot of solo exhibitions with, I don't know, he will tell you more about. So he will give us like a five minutes mini presentation, maybe when it's more than we have not so much to talk anymore. Okay? Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, excuse me for the quality of uh, the, the images. Um, I think one subject we will discuss later uh, will be how, is, uh, how can we make a good documentation about sound art. When I started with my gallery in the 80s, I had a big video camera uh, and I did documentation, but today the technique changed so much, so I cannot use the old tapes. So uh, I have only some, um, some pictures, some photos, uh, to, to show you only a little bit about the, atmos the atmosphere, the place, the building, and uh, to make clear that uh, I didn't only show sound art. Sound art has, had to be integrated in the whole program. So um, this uh, is a part of an installation of a German painter called Huber. At that time, he... Uh, uh, made paintings about painting. So, and in the next, see the, uh, show the next. Sorry. My, my technology understanding is all not so good. <laughs> it's this one, yeah. So I was part, uh, the curator was part of uh, uh, the exhibition and I had to sit there to work uh, every day. Uh, the next. Uh, this is uh, in a court of uh, the building, the, the spaces are around this, this court in two floors. And in the foreground uh, is a big sound machine of uh, Gunther Demnisch. At that time, he was very young and uh, he did a lot of uh, sound arts, but uh, after some years, not anymore. Um, he is the one who invented this uh, special stones in Berlin, memoring. Uh, to the, uh, the Jews, Jewish people. And uh, this was a, it, it was a kind of siren driven by a fan, very loud, like uh, the tr trumpets of uh, Jericho. Next, please. Uh, this uh, was performance. Performance uh, was also a uh, uh, main subject uh, in our program and concerts with new music, music and uh, improvised music. This uh, was the performer Lorbeer um, directly fixed on the building. You, the next one, you see, so you can see the building. And this was uh, an artist working with uh, biological material. And uh, so it was like uh, uh, this glass box, like... Uh, um, uh, compost, com com this uh, compost, and the gas coming out of the compost he used uh, to drive uh, glass pipes. And there was wonderful sound from time to time, 
filling up uh, the courtyard with a, with a lot of overtones in different layers. So, next one. This uh, was uh, a Japanese artist, uh, Takahashi, from New York. Um, he uh, is working, still working, uh, about the question, what is perception? What is visual perception? And you could go through revolving doors uh, with mirrors. And uh, the place was in the shape of a billiard board. Next. Another uh, Japanese artist after Chernobyl, um, atomic shoot um, with this uh, ironical uh, things and images about uh, our civilization perhaps in the future um, with uh, um, interesting small machines protecting us against X-rays and so on. This is... Uh, an image from uh, a picture from an installation of Robin Minard um, with plastic tubes, with loudspeakers integrated, and of course, uh, the sound you hear is not only coming from the loudspeakers but from the vibration of the, uh, the air in, in the tubes. This, you, uh, this is another space, you can see only a little wire in the structure, and it's an installation of uh, Christina Kubisch. You, you could hear a special sound mixture from uh, outside sound and uh, um, artificial sound with uh, earphones. Next one. This uh, an uh, from an exhibition of Terry Fox, another artist. You had to imagine th the crashing nuts I think, and this are some uh, elements of an installation of Rolf Julius, who died two years ago. Next one. And this, and this is the last uh, one of, the yeah, the second last, is uh, uh, Akio Suzuki, you know perhaps. Um, he built somewhere in the mountains in Japan this space out of, uh, handmade bricks to uh, catch the sound of uh, the environment, only for that reason. And he was sitting, two, he, two years he was building with his friends uh, this building, he was bu and uh, then he sat down for 12 hours to hear the sound, the soundscape. And it is from 89, I guess, right? And now it's yeah. quite... And away, and because it's, it was lame. Last. What is lame in English? Handmade bricks, like, and after 20 years with sun and rain. Yeah. And it's uh, conceptual-wise, when you know the autodatus, which is quite now, last year was in Brussels, just now in Kortrijk, the idea is that these materials are so ephemeral that they're going away yeah. after a while. Perhaps I can uh, later... Uh, tell more about uh, the attitude of, of this artist. The last one is an installation um, I curated in Tokyo uh, in uh, 2006, I, uh, five, 2005. Um, metal plates fixed together, but very, <coughs> not very stable, and uh, some stones on it. So you know, in uh, Tokyo there is often earthquake, or there are many earthquakes, nearly every day you cannot uh, feel it. But you could see it in the, in the gallery, in this installation, because the vibration was uh, uh, coming in, and you could hear the stones on the, the metal blades. Okay. But uh, we, also, we will mix a little bit the presentation, and, uh, because five minutes is even not enough to get any idea about this, what uh, great work, which what you did, so 50, 17 years, but what was the reason to start with this gallery shortly to, because it was an institution like a city gallery, you know, in a city gallery normally uh, showing works of local artists, that's this idea of a city gallery, and uh, I think that was something else what you did, or we'll find another way, because you have also not the background as an art historian or I know that you're coming from, you, you, work, you are a forester, then you're starting to work in, um, the radio. in the radio, later the TV, 
journalism and art and science, we will say today, like art and science, sounds great, uh, in the 80s, uh, 70s, 80s. Yeah. So, but what was the idea to, to, to start with the gallery? Yeah, I have to explain a little bit about my work in radio. I was responsible for science and art, and, 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 no, culture and, and science. And we had an, uh, a good symphony orchestra. And in the 70s, um, I think 71, we got a new conductor, uh, Hans Zender, who mm -hmm. is now an uh, older person and a uh, known, well-known uh, composer. composer. Mm -hmm. And he was very open for new music. And I had the wonderful uh, possibility to, to, to get to know uh, many composers and young musicians like uh, um, the, the uh, Stockhausen, um, Luigi Nono, Boulez, so everybody was a cage. And uh, there was a lecture with a philosopher, 71, Georg Picht, and in this lecture he said, the battle against the noise of the machines in our uh, industrial society is one of the biggest challenge for the future. Yeah. And I kept this in mind. I think in 2002 you stopped you, the gallery work, then it was kind of strange, like what happened after a visionaire starting with a project and then by political reasons kicked off. You maybe can understand the situation. But now, since I think a year, the City Gallery is back with a new young director and also again connected with a, what was also one of the uh, strong connections between the City Gallery and the Sound Art Education Department from Christina Kubisch on the art school in Saarbrücken, Habe Kazar. And uh, now the, the new director of the City Gallery is back and will also do like two, year, two times a year uh, this kind of sound artworks or installations or exhibitions. Perhaps we should mention that I produced eight books mm -hmm. about sound art and uh, it was because I <coughs> thought it's really difficult to, to make a good documentation. So uh, every book has a uh, CD and uh, there is at that time was not very much theory about what, what is it, what mm -hmm. is it, how, which, how, how important is it for our perception. So uh, I tried to, to bring it in, in, in the books from different uh, uh, point of views. Yeah, but that brings me also to this kind of a part of this talk, what uh, I want to recognize that people in the art field who are normally not having this kind of strong art historian background, often being this kind of curators who are working or also uh, being able to work with sound or media, so the first big video uh, art exhibitions. So I think that was the problem of uh, also the thing what we discuss here the whole day, how sound is part of a um, traditional uh, art life in a way, and uh, the City Gallery was one of these examples because as a City Gallery it's part of this um, tradition of museums, galleries, art um, places. And in, in this case it was really important and I think uh, Bernd knows also all this uh, people like Schneckenburger or uh, you know all these uh, famous curators. And uh, in this case this place was really one of the important, and I'm really happy that somebody young took it over now because um, in, the, in the meantime, like the last six years, it was quite boring what's happened there. And uh, when you settle up such a thing and then you see that it's going completely down, uh, then it's good to be far away. Bernd lives since then in Berlin. It's a bit better to be not too near at a place where you can see really and listen that it's going down. So I had a, a, a little bit another kind of history because I'm not a forester <laughs> in a way and um, and it's quite difficult to, to make it in like in five minutes but um, my background I come from music and I started uh, to study uh, orchestra, orchestra music trombone 
And when the war coming down, I'm from East Berlin, I started to be interested in other things, even before too, but then it was possible to have a wider horizon on education, and I studied art history and uh, sociology and philosophy and musicology and everything else, and then I started with projects in music, so in contemporary music. I also work with Nono, uh, with, with Lachemann and uh, other people till around 2002, and before in 96. Uh, 95, I joined in. It was typical for East Berlin at this time. You were, there were a lot of empty locations, like because there was no reason, like a factory uh, went bankrupt or a church was empty or uh, a bunker was uh, to get for free. So this was uh, the, the good times in Berlin, in East Berlin mainly. Uh, it's also done now. So when you're going now, it's still quite cheap, but to get a place for exhibitions and so on, it's uh, for people, local people, quite difficult to pay the stuff. But in this time, uh, there was a little art organization who found um, a, a church, an empty baroque church in the middle of the city, and it was 30 years closed uh, because it was a storage. You know, maybe the stories from Soviet Union, the church becoming a sport palace or uh, whatever. So in, that was in East Berlin, a beautiful one of the two Baroque churches, and it has also a history and sound because it has a glockenspiel on the tower, the biggest one in Germany. And this church was quite strong, connected with a with a kingdom, and with a king, a Prussian king. No, I cannot show anything. First, I have to close it because of being a technician and speak, it's quite uh, you know like I can make up. So this is this is uh, São Paulo where I lived when I was a child. <laughs> Uh, but this is another story. Um, just a second. So it's, uh, you know, like... Um, we opened this gallery, and I think I show you now the first picture, and you see me 18 years younger, because it was, it was on the 30s of... May 96. Oh, I remember you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and maybe you know, you remember this East German uh, young politicians after 89. So I decided to go to the university because I was like 28, I think, right? Yeah. 25. Again, because um, it was a big freedom to go to the whole university and do whatever you want. And uh, this was quite later. So this was our first exhibition in, the, in, the, in this church. And we did, since then, like 88 projects altogether in the last 18 years. Only in the church we had 55 solo exhibitions, because there were several spaces. It was not like a museum where you can really uh, have several, uh, separated spaces, but all the spaces been in a way connected. But there was a big nave and a little space in the tower, the so-called belfry uh, room. And there we started with smaller site-specific or installation art. Oh, that was the first one. There's a book also. Um, I also published some books. Um, uh, there's a book uh, um, published in 2009, I guess, for the first 11 years from all the projects, about all the projects in the church. In uh, this time, the gallery has a name, Singur Hörgalerie in Parochial. Hörgalerie have nothing to do with prostitution. It's about listening. And this name came out because I, come I came from music when I started this project. And even after three, five years, I wanted to change the name because uh, I almost realized that it's not about listening only, it's about art. That is not the music stuff. In Berlin, it was quite typical that Soundart was financed this project money comes from the music department. And the media art was financed from the visual arts department, so it was good to stay there because otherwise you're getting nothing when you come to, when you come too late. Anyway, this was the last final exhibition in 2006 from Marion Amache, and it was also a piece where you can say after this, nobody else should do anything more in this space because it was even interesting to work over 11 years with so much artist on the, in the same venue. Uh, and the venue is not like clean, not neutral. That is, we can talk about this too, maybe not, for the time is running. So I show you the second space. So the book uh, is uh, still available in, this, uh, in the Kera Verlag. It's in English and German. It has a seven and a half hour sound DVD where you can listen to a lot of sounds. 
you see we both talking and talking and not playing any sound. And we have a nice sound system, but we don't, we don't trust sound systems. Because I think that is, we can start already. Uh, sometimes this is talk, so I think presentation is still there, but um, that uh, this kind of art, you, you need your individual presence to, to get it in a way, to get a real experience. So to talk about this and uh, play you some nice sounds from two speakers, giving you even not an idea what it is, in my understanding. So that's why I'm also changing it more and more that the gallery is not anymore a gallery coming from music. Or it's now a gallery making art projects. For me, it's sound art, installation art. That um, I know a lot of people who have completely other ideas about sound art. Um, it's difficult to change names, even sound art, it's a quite boring name, but it's uh, art with sound, or not only with sound, as you also can see in the exhibition uh, from Overtone, but also in the other exhibition, I guess, uh, that uh, sound is one of the materials, and you can look how the people working with the materials in this moment when sound becoming available uh, in a way that you can work with technology and you can create and form like sculpturing with sound, that was a moment when the artist starting to work with this material. Before, sound was like in Fluxus, uh, kind of everyday, daily material, but what you have to work with, because nobody works with sound, singing on Nam Yum Paik or somebody else. But then later on, artists really working strong or in another way to form with sound, installation, sculptures. Um, and this is also about light and temperature and uh, a lot of other things coming together. It's, um, I always, uh, all the time, now I'm out of this, but I was all the time against this eight channel uh, installations uh, from the computer music, because this you can do everywhere. And for my interest, it was all the time this site specificity, this really, the relationship to space. So this is for me kind of understanding all those stuff, uh, the, the, the exhibitions which I'm doing or which I'm curating. But you know there are some artists or many artists yeah. who hate the term uh, sound art. Mm. Yeah? yeah. So, and like, and uh, on the other hand, uh, Rolf Julius, <clears throat> who is really one of the best, I think still, he was always saying, what I'm doing is music. music yeah. Or art. <laughs> Yeah, or, or Bernhard Leitner said he's a Tonraumkünstler. So it's, uh, he don't, he's a sound space artist and not a sound artist. And you can imagine that it's difficult to work with and you have to work with the space, otherwise this space kills you as an artist. So I saw also before my time some exhibitions where the space is killed, the artworks. That brings us to this little topic uh, of the space. No, because a band works, in a, even this gallery was in an old, nice building in the inner city of Saarbrücken. Yeah. Um, but still you had a kind of, not white cube, but white wall space. <laughs> and, and more a connection uh, to the outside. Yeah. So uh, here you... Here you completely you in the bunker, uh, yeah. yeah. You are completely uh, uh, covered. Yeah, but also it's a kind of difference. So we discussed in this talk what we had, like this topic of a neutral space, because we are both thinking that there is not any neutral space in the world. Even a white cube is not neutral, because every piece can be uh -huh. um, have a completely other... But you were working mostly in, in, in old uh, um, historical buildings with a special, Benjamin would say, aura. Yeah. Was it, is that easier? To, as a curator, or is it more complicated? Uh, I'm not sure. I think it's quite interesting. It comes like it comes, because um, I have not kind of a final education where you can get a director job or whatever. And I started to make projects, and then artists coming, and it was um, also not um, an accident, because I studied with Helga de la Motthaba, uh, in Berlin, and she is one of the, in Germany, one of the famous and important people in sound art. All her students, or a lot of her students, are working in this field, or know a lot of this. So that was uh, the starting point, but the, the starting point to work with sound art in the spaces before, in the church, was really the space. 
because how you can do and sound uh, like an exhibition. We did, for example, we have also visual arts exhibition, but that's like, that was like six by four meter big monochrome paintings. That was great in the space, it works. But little sculptures, nothing worked out there. So in, in this case, for me, it's, um, I will be not saying it's more interesting, that's not true. There was not so much the possibility in, in other spaces to work, so we had to, we made together the Resonanzen exhibition in Saarbrücken, and I really loved the spaces, and also even these white spaces are beautifully, and uh, as you had written in our uh, talk, that these spaces give you another way of perceive, uh, like thin aesthetic um, ideas from artists or whatever, because the, the historical space is also sometimes pressing you in a special direction. So it depends a little bit on the artist. But uh, on the other side, it's for every artist and also for me, it, it's a really nice experience every year when you've been in the same space that somebody came, like Arnu, for example, and doing a completely other thing than somebody else and have a completely other artistic idea to work in the space. And um, the main, uh, the good thing is that I think that experience also you had here that you need time in a space because in a normal exhibition, uh, the gallery is uh, bringing the stuff from, from their storages and then the curator and the team have to set up the, the, the artworks and that's it. And maybe you, have, you can decide is a picture more higher or maybe in another space. But uh, when you're working site-specific, what all the artists have to do in such spaces, then you have to really study and uh, doing a lot of research, like not only, uh, also like tests, experiments, mm -hmm. And that's I like, that it, uh, there's all the time a process where you think the exhibition opening is even not the, the final end. It's even maybe a step on a way to coming deeper in a situation to create an atmosphere or an artistic, an aesthetic situation in a space. That's I like on working on the space. But I also did some exhibitions in white cubes uh, mm -hmm. from like, besides this, I had like 100 exhibitions I did in the last years and there were maybe 20 also in typical museum spaces. And then sometimes we destroy the museums and sometimes uh, we also like it to, to play with this kind of neutral, what is not neutral. I remember one space in Berlin, um, you could invite uh, artists to work in studios. Could you uh, talk a little bit about uh, that? Yeah, but that this was, was uh, very this was, yeah. Tesla. Yeah, okay, but this is a completely other thing. So yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah therefore, staying, I, I found it so yeah. interesting because you could ah. uh, you could do uh, the same time uh, to sh to show something or to to bring to hear something and um, to to make a research. Yeah, but this was kind of uh, you know normally when you're working only in one field you're becoming quite boring. So that was one of this uh, project which running all the time at the same time. So but. I don't want to talk too much about it. It was also with sound art, but it was also with media art. Uh, so we're coming sometimes nearer by that stuff, uh, also what we're seeing here, because often artists try to work more with objects to get it better um, sold or uh, also like transported to other spaces. Mm -hmm. The aim of the Zingo was all the time really, also we, I think we have also five exhibitions from 88, which com comes and then you are positioned or there was a kind of variation in the space. But this, the important thing was really that all the productions been new and f made for this space. And after this, it's done. That's a, a quite strong uh, thing that I remember quite well from the beginning when I had more time <laughs> that we have hours and nights we've been in the exhibition and we recording it, uh, four hours, five hours, a bird starting in the morning. And it was really a great time because you're living in a way with this art. Not only with the artist, the artist being at home, but we're still like six weeks there because this is the nice thing of installation. It's a kind of life. And, um, and you have to secure the life of the, of the, of the artwork. That is also important uh, in opposite to a kind of idea of a conservative museum which all the putting the artwork somewhere and then it's done. The, the sound works not only technical wise they're having an own life like um, often artists can tell tell us stories 
like what, how the sound changed um, or whatever. We had today to talk about the feedback because the feedback is never stable. It's like, an, it's like a, a dragon, you know, like you never know what's going on. Sometimes it can stop out, uh, outside it's raining and then it's completely uh, beautiful tuned installation is completely fucked up. And the next day the sun is coming back and it's great, you know. So you never know. So that is also what I really like on my work in this field. So I'm a little bit too focused on, on sound art maybe, but on, on the other side, what for me as a curator is important, um, and I think we are clear about this, that you need to know a lot about this kind of art form. Otherwise, so when I see a space or when I see a situation and I work with an artist, I, don't, I cannot help him in a way, but I can give him an understanding sometimes or faster how sometimes things working. Because I saw, I don't know how much exhibition the sound and I heard a lot and so you see like a, a kind of grotta and you know exactly which kind of sound working perfectly to reflect in this kind of space or you know like this. Mm -hmm. And I think you need really a lot of ex, uh, real experience and you, cannot, you can read thousands of books and you can listen to, uh, hours of music but you have never an understanding how a sound works in the space because the space is all the time in your ears and even when you press up it's a little bit outside but still there <laughs> you yeah um, i remember one thing in the in the 80s um, when you uh, were talking a little bit about the where, where, where does the money comes from sometimes it, it plays a role yeah the politicians responsible for the gallery were wondering about uh, what what is he doing with this money so it's, they all could understand um, for an exhibition you need uh, money for the transport for the insurance for maybe a catalog, for invitations, and perhaps for the wine, for the opening. Um, but uh, I started paying fee for the artists because they, yeah, they, they had to develop. They had to, to be there for one week or two weeks to install their things, to, to find out uh, how the sound is. And uh, so I paid them uh, a fee and I paid material. And they, many works uh, were uh, uh, done by, by artists and uh, at the end they uh, took everything away and they could uh, sell it, uh, perhaps, or install uh, or, uh, again, they could use it again. But it, it, it took me about five to ten years to, to convince the politicians that this is normal. Yeah? They, they always were uh, protesting against uh, this, uh, this uh, money I gave away. It's yes, the same history. That maybe that's why we understand us so, so nice when I come first time to Saarbrücken. Because when, you, when you're being in this field and you need this real experience of artworks, you have to go to this place. So in the moment when I started uh, like I think in 93 or so, I took all the way the long way to Saarbrücken from Berlin. It's like a long, long way, eight hours. And when you have no money, you have to find a way to go there. But uh, I think I was, most of the exhibitions after like 2000, I don't know, uh, 1993 or four, I started. And it was really, really, really beautiful. And we had the same history because when I started in 96, uh, because I'm coming from music and I give composers like 3,000 marks for a composition for string quartets, 10,000 for chamber music, 20,000 for an orchestra piece. That why sound artists getting no money because he's doing also this long time work of researching, installing, and so on and so on. And uh, from the beginning on, that was the aim of the gallery too. Even if we are a non-profit organization, we paying fees. And I have all the time discussions with museums directors like last year in a jury. He said, no, an artist getting no fee. And the technician get more money at the end as the artist who comes for a week to set up his work. And that was the director from the museum's custom mall, I can say it here. Uh, the new director who comes from video art, so he getting the video and then he put it in. The technician built a nice surrounding, but that's the completely even the opposite of about a good video installation. Because also when you're working in video art, you know that it's good when the artist is alive who's, who settle up a kind of situation in the space. Anyway. 
We are just finishing, yeah, 25, so I give you an, a, the last trip because he wants to bring me to another project uh, in the meantime, so we have not too much time about speaking about everything, but about a little bit. So this is uh, the last space and uh, last year we stopped working in this water reservoir. Uh, next week we have our third, 18th birthday, we're becoming adult and I close the gallery. Uh, after 18 years and we started on the same day, uh, two days later, with a new project and, and it's all, the name is Zingur Projects and we will do more residency-based and, and exhibitions and sometimes also bigger projects. So we have a big outdoor concert project with uh, site-specific compositions made also for a part of the city. When you're going later for coffee, I put some flyers on. I have also a project in Bonn in June, a big project. Mickey Yu is here. She playing, a, uh, I hope and I, I know, a wonderful outdoor concert on the last end, last day of the festival. So when you have time, it's not too far from here. It's far to go to Berlin. It's near to go to Bonn. This is a, a Edwin van der Heide exhibition 2009 in the big uh, F7 in the big water reservoir. This is uh, Arno Jacobs, a little tribute to. Uh, the guy who invited us. You see, it's even when I show it fast or slow, you get really no idea about it. But I can, we can speak like an hour about this piece and maybe. So it was an echolocator using this special acoustic resonance. It was a piece from in 2009 from Michael Moser in the small water reservoir with big uh, glass sheets with transducers creating spaces in the space only with big sound membranes, and that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, we had only 30 minutes, but that was a deal. Um, and, and we are open for the next friends. I'm really happy that Nicole uh, Gingras is here from Montreal and Carlos from Torino. And let's go further in the program, otherwise we never will finish this. Thank you.